The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. All of the same sorts of things that you, know, you can do to reduce your dementia risk are the same sorts of things that are going to keep your memory going um, and keep your cognitive functioning going as long as possible. Then, later on The Agenda. To the extent that older people were sort of buying into those negative aging, the more they did so, then the lower their quality of life um, they were reporting to experience. Also tonight. The, the way you, you really feel or the way you see things or, or, or the person you would like to be, you, you can um, you put your best you know, face in, in the song. How is it that society seems to hold two diametrically opposed stereotypes about aging at the same time? Old people are cognitively impaired and too frail to do much of anything. Or, conversely, they are the wise owls who've gained the insight of the ages. The former is probably more prevalent than the latter, but should it be? With us now to consider all of that, let's welcome, in Los Angeles, California, Daniel Levitin, the James McGill Professor Emeritus of Neuroscience and Music at McGill University and the author of Successful Aging, a Neuroscientist Explores the Power and Potential of Our Lives. In Austin, Texas, Allison Sekuler, the Sandra A. Rotman Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience at the Rotman Research Institute, and President and Chief Scientist at the Baycrest Academy for Research and Education. And here in the downtown of our provincial capital, Natasha Raja. She is Professor of Psychology at Toronto Metropolitan University and Canada Research Chair in Sex, Gender and Diversity in Brain Health, Memory and Aging. And have we got the right three for this discussion today? Welcome everybody, it's great to have you on TVO tonight. Daniel, to you first, when it comes to the brain and old age, the standard story is, it's a story of decline. You forget things. You cognitively slow down. Is that the whole story? Well, to begin with, slow isn't necessarily bad. We know from the work of Daniel Kahneman and others that slow, deliberate cognitions tend to be more accurate than snap judgments. Another part of the story is that older adults show increases in impulse control. So if there's a a red button lying around that might launch a war, you want to have good impulse control. Uh, older adults tend to be better at empathy and problem solving. They see the big picture faster and better. Uh, not every older adult, these are, these are statistical uh, averages. Understood. All right, Allison, what would you add to that? It sounds like the answer to the question though is, that's not the full story. What would you add? It's not. Yeah, I'd say it's absolutely not the full story, and, and there's there's really trade-offs. So you might get slower at some things, you might get faster at other things. But you're also accumulating more and more and more knowledge throughout your lifetime, and you're better able to sort of integrate all of that together and understand how, as, as Daniel said, the big picture kind of fits together. So we've actually done studies in our lab where we've done experiments showing not even just, you know, in, in, in sort of the metaphorical terms of the big picture, but in physical terms, the big picture. Sometimes older people can actually see, they don't necessarily see the fine details as well, but they can see the big picture better and they respond to that big picture faster. So it's definitely not just a story of a decline. And we also know that the older brain can rewire itself in some ways to, to compensate for weaknesses as we're getting older. So there's a lot of what's called plasticity in the brain. Um, so as some parts might start to not work as well, other parts can take over. So it's not just an all or nothing um, headed toward decline story anymore. And we have talked to Norman Deutsch on this program about that very subject. Natasha, let's let's do the deeper dive here on one of the age-old stereotypes, which is our memory definitely gets worse as we get older. True or false? It depends, will be my answer. Because memory is not this unified construct that people think of. There's many types of memory, many different types of memory systems and different brain regions that are implicated in our ability to form and do mnemonic tasks or memory tasks. So I think when people think that memory declines with age, what they're thinking about is episodic memory, a type of memory system that's dependent on the hippocampus and the frontal lobes and our ability to recollect past experiences in rich detail. So, you know, what did you have for breakfast yesterday or three days ago? 
things like that. People, you know, when they can't remember that, they're like, oh, my memory is declining. But that's not the only type of memory. Um, our memory for facts and knowledge um, actually might increase with age as we get more and more exposure and day-to-day -day life experiences. Our implicit memories, so our memory for learning how to, you know, play the piano, our ability to swim, all those kinds of memories remain relatively intact in healthy aging. So it's not as though all forms of memory decline. Some types do decline, and they start to decline much earlier in midlife. So it's not an older adult-only situation, and they're influenced by many factors such as stress, attention ability. So it's not necessarily a memory problem that you're seeing either. I'm going to come back to that notion of it doesn't only happen once you become a septuagenarian or octogenarian. It actually happens earlier. But but following up actually from what you just said here, and Daniel, I'll go to you on this. If you're dealing with somebody who forgets a name or can't come up with a word, which is something, you know, utterly universal, how much should we read into that in terms of whether it's representative of an overall cognitive decline? I, I think one of the things to recognize, I, I'm in the wonderful position of being a university professor, as you know, and so I see a new crop of 19 and 20 year olds every year. And let me tell you, they have memory problems. <laughs> they forget names. They forget where their classroom is. They forget their, they lose their phones and their car keys. One of the things that differ, is different is that if you're 20 and you lose your cell phone, the story you tell yourself is, well, I've got a lot on my plate or I didn't get enough sleep last night or I had too much to drink. When you're 75, the same thing happens and the story is, oh my God, it's Alzheimer's. This is the end. <laughs> same behavior, different narrative. So, Allison, why do we tend to be stereotyping older people when this happens and cutting a pass for younger people? I, I think because, you know, there is such fear over Alzheimer's and related dementia. So for people who don't know, Alzheimer's is just one form of dementia, it's the most common form, but there's lots of other kinds. And and because everyone is so afraid of it, um, they are really worried as they're getting older. They know it's associated with aging. That's the biggest risk factor for, for dementia. Um, and so as your memory starts to fade a little bit there, you know, it's the first sort of go-to is, oh no, I must be headed down that road. But there are so many different things that you can do to uh, reduce your risk for dementia uh, and, and even to improve your memory and maintain your memory and improve your cognitive function as you're getting older. So all of the same sorts of things that you, know, you can do to reduce your dementia risk are the same sorts of things that are going to keep your memory going um, and keep your cognitive functioning going as long as possible. Natasha, I imagine at TMU, you hang out with a lot of younger people, and I wonder whether you notice the same thing Daniel just mentioned, which is that they're as forgetful as older people, but they just cut themselves a pass on it because they're young. I do. I do see that they're, like, even in our lab, well, a lot of the traditional memory tasks that we use, we're seeing a decline in young adults. So it, it really depends. Like, one thing to keep in mind is historically, a lot of the research that has been done in memory research has been very uh, fixed on university students or people with university education from higher socioeconomic status groups. And in our lab, we've actually started to look at more diverse uh, groups of individuals. And one of the ways to do this is to reduce the educational attainment requirements for participation in these studies. And by doing this, we actually see a lot more overlap in memory function across our age groups, saying that it's not just about aging, it's also about our, you know, the social determinants of health and our experiences through life and the opportunities afforded us that support how well we perform on these kinds of memory tasks. Okay. Having having now established that, let's circle back to the point you made earlier, and I want to go back to Daniel on this, because as we've established, uh, you don't have to be a septuagenarian or octogenarian to have memory problems. In fact, in your book, Daniel, you note that from age 30 to 71, every year that goes by, our reaction time slows by 1 25th of a second. So how does the speed at which our brains process things relate to how intelligent we are? Well, I, I go back, I would go back to this notion that um, slow, deliberate judgments where we take in all of the facts and we take our time to decide tend to work out better for us rather than impulsive ones. Um, and I guess I don't mean to uh, nitpick nits, but uh, depends on what you mean by intelligence. If you mean emotional intelligence, the ability to solve interpersonal problems or uh, issues having to do with uh, differing opinions, older adults tend to be better at that because they experience more empathy. 
So I would say they have greater emotional intelligence. Um, a slow judgment for uh, coming up with a name or a math problem. I don't know that that's intelligence. It's something that's useful, but perhaps not a warning side sign. Right. But Allison, we seem to live in a society that really prizes speed, right? The faster you get there, the smarter we seem to think you are. Unfair? Completely unfair. Uh, there's actually a recent study out of Baycrest and University of Toronto by one of my colleagues, Jed Meltzer, looking at speech patterns and whether you can predict cognitive function and aging uh, changes with, with speech patterns. And if I speak like this and I'm choosing my words very carefully, the, there's pauses between there, but I'm, as Daniel said, I'm trying to be thoughtful in terms of the words that I'm choosing. What tends to be more predictive in terms of the speech pattern is the rate at which somebody is speaking in between those, in those pauses. So there's, again, it's not even in terms of your speech and changes in your speech or uh, changes in processing. It's not even all or nothing there. There can be different kinds of pauses and changes in te temporal processing. So in general, uh, yeah, we will see the you know neural signals in the brain are going to be slowing down, but it does not mean that someone's not as able to do anything. My, my dad, for example, 84, still a professor, a neuroscience professor, it actually has collaborated with, with Natasha in the past and me. Uh, and um, he's not retired yet. And he, you know, he celebrated his 80th birthday by cycling 26 miles. Uh, and, you know, so you can't judge a book by its age, for sure. What post-secondary institution is he at? He's at Brandeis down in, uh, down in the States. I, I want to take his class. Sign me up. That it's sounds amazing. Funny. Actually, it's quite funny. <laughs> okay, let me read this. We're going to continue here with a, a quote from an article published by Harvard Medical School. Uh, as it relates to what we've been discussing. And here we go. As we age, connections between distant brain areas strengthen. These changes enable the aging brain to become better at detecting relationships between diverse sources of information, capturing the big picture, and understanding the global implications of specific issues. Perhaps this is the foundation of wisdom. As if with age, your brain becomes better at seeing the entire forest and worse, at seeing the leaves. Okay, let's look into that. Natasha, do you like that analogy? So I do like that analogy, but I do want to like give a caveat there as well. I think, um, you know, when you become a neuroimaging uh, specialist, and so when you do neuroimaging studies, you do see some structural uh, disconnections in the white matter. So there is, it's not all connectivity remains uh, with aging, and but there is a lot of variability, individual variability. Um, but I do agree that in the functional imaging world, what we see is with age, there's a greater generalization in the networks that are engaged to do a wide variety of uh, different types of tasks. And so this generalization reflects both this ability, a higher efficiency to maybe process things that have similarity, but with it, there are always costs to the benefits. And so there's also the cost of perhaps not being as flexible and fluid in being able to fl uh, fluctuate between tasks. So yes, you are more efficient. You might be able to see the, the forest for the trees, but when the trees matter, you might not be able to switch to focusing just on the trees. Ah, interesting. Okay, Daniel, can I get you to follow up on that in terms of whether you like that analogy of the forest and the trees and whether it makes sense to you? I think what the imaging studies show is, is uh, just what we've, we've heard is that uh, there is some white matter degradation. There's degradation of gray matter. White matter are the links between the computational hubs, the processing centers that are the uh, the gray matter. Um, I think the central point here is that good decision making results from being able to see patterns. And if nothing else, humans evolved to be great pattern detectors, great predictors of what's going to come next. And the more information you have, the more accumulated experience of things that you've uh, seen and, um, it, well, experiences that you've had, the easier it is to draw connections between them. And that's what Harvard is talking about. The connections between disparate ideas become strengthened and more accessible to an older adult. I, I give an example of radiology. Radiology is pattern matching. If, if you go in for an x-ray and you are afraid that you might have a tumor, you want a 75-year-old radiologist reading the slide, not a 28-year-old. You want somebody who has seen it all and is able to quickly form an accurate judgment. Well, can I follow up on that? Okay, 75 versus 29. What would you rather have, though? 
85 or 40? I think it depends. It really depends, Steve. So there, there are some people who are not doing well after 80 or 85. There are people not doing well after 60. That happens. But I look to the models, uh, the Dalai Lama, age 88, I met him when he was 84 and he had just published his 125th book. Uh, that's a picture of us together on the wall. Uh, Jane Goodall at 89, um, who uh, is still carrying a, a, a very complicated and vigorous tour schedule, trying to recruit, recruit young adults to become more concerned about climate awareness. And look at David Suzuki at 87, still hosting The Nature of Things brilliantly, which he's done since 1979. Hmm. I know you're all dying to have me ask you the question that you think I'm going to ask you, but I'm not going to ask that yet. I'm holding off on that question. We're going to get to some other things first. And maybe, you know what, Allison, maybe you want to maybe you want to bring your dad's example into this, maybe you don't. But what do you, what do you think your dad at 84 is is better at now than he might have been at uh, 28? But my dad is actually a lot better at interacting with human beings than he was when he was younger because he's learned, again, it's pattern recognition. You sort of, you learn what it is that's going to um, help help you interact with people in the right way to spark conversations. He has a lot of stories. He's always been funny. I think he's just getting funnier and funnier as he's going on. So you definitely want to take his class if you have a chance to. And, um, you know, I think he's also become more creative. Uh, there's There's some, you know, ideas around decreased inhibition and increased creativity uh, that are floating around these days. And that's it is one of the things we think happens as you get older is that some of the inhibitory mechanisms may be declining. But we also think that's one of the reasons that you can see the bigger picture better. And we think it may also be making people more creative. So, um, And I just have to tell a, a very quick story about David Suzuki because we had him in our lab a couple of years ago, right before pandemic. And uh, we were doing a test with him where normally what we see is um, if somebody is walking and talking at the same time, their walking slows down. So we tried to do this for the nature of things for special we were doing with him. And we said, okay, walk. And we, we saw how fast he was walking. And then we said, okay, now David, name as many animals as you can think of while you're walking. And he actually sped up. So it's, it's definitely not the case that, you know, aging is going to affect everybody in exactly the same way. Well, all right, let's follow up on that with Natasha. Does the aging brain become more flexible and open to new information as it gets older? Or the converse, which is what we all suspect, that it becomes more rigid and stuck in its ways? What does science tell us? So I think individual variability is something I really want to highlight here because there is a lot of individual variability that we need to account for, and many people maintain their cognitive function with aging. But the research that I've done suggests that there is more generalization of function. So in the sense that, you know, the same, like I said earlier, like different tasks will engage very similar networks. Now within that milieu, you could see that there might be some flexibility to switch and draw on different cognitive processes to attack different tasks. But when there is a requirement to make a drastic switch and to like, really change systems, then you do see a bit of an age-related so there is this task-related switching effect, and there are some executive functions that do tend to decline, but again, on average. So I think, you know, there is, um, there, there is a lot of individual differences, but in general, I think there is uh, some flexibility, but flexibility tends to decline with aging, but we become more efficient in processing things that we have experiences with. And so this comes to emotional regulation and empathy that was already talked about. We really do improve these abilities because we've had a lot of experiences and similar situations that we could build off those models to act in the current environment. Daniel, follow up on that if you would. As you get older, easier or harder to regulate your emotions? Again, it, it, it's tricky to make broad generalizations. Some older adults have great difficulty regulating their emotions, but on average, most older adults are better at regulating their emotions uh, and Part of that is that they experience increases in empathy, tolerance, uh, and and a sort of the dulce vita kind of a an attitude that boy things are pretty good. I'm I'm happy I'm alive. Uh, the older adults tend to be more grateful, and so I think all of that helps form a better picture. Well, 
okay, I'm going to indulge the three of you here. Let's go here now. Because, of course, not only is the upcoming presidential race in the United States uh, the first rematch in a century, more than a century, between two, uh, a current president and an ex-president, uh, but it's also the oldest matchup in American history. And I guess, well, we know that the polls th say that people think, the vast majority of people think Joe Biden at age 81 today is too old to serve for another term. And we know that uh, 62% rather, People think Donald Trump, who was 77, is also too old to have another go around. It is true that Joe Biden from time to time can look somewhat frail, although he sure didn't at the State of the Union the other night. And Donald Trump from time to time can say the most nonsensical, disgraceful things. So the question I guess I want the three of you to tackle is, how old is too old to be president of the United States? Allison. So I just put my cards on the table. I'm a dual citizen, so I actually will be voting uh, in the upcoming election. Uh, and um, I won't say you know what way I vote, but the there is no answer to that question. It really, as we've been hearing, it depends is the answer. There's so many individual differences. I would rather have you know a, a 90 year old, 110 year old, if it's a certain person, than I would have a 45 year old if it's somebody else. Um, I'd rather have someone who's got experience as long as long as that particular person is still able to make the right kinds of decisions. And as Dan said before, you know, sometimes being slow doesn't mean that your brain is slow. It just means that you're being thoughtful. Um, and you've got a lot of information you're you're integrating. And you see this even in young kids. I mean, so young kids sometimes have different um, uh, diagnoses of, of being uh, slower to process information. But sometimes the, the people who are slowest to process information are actually the most intelligent because they've got so much information in their heads that they're trying to integrate that it takes them a while to come up with the right answer. I would rather wait and come up with the right answer than than not. So in, I'm, in looking at how old is too old, uh, there is no answer. And I think the other thing to point out when people say that this is the oldest race is you have to look at age relative to life expectancy. Yeah. So we had early on a number of presidents in their 60s. That was pretty much the end of life back then. Now our life expectancy is a lot longer. So even if someone's in their 70s or 80s, they're not actually as as old uh, in the in the context of society as some of our presidents have been in the past. That's a great point. Everything is relative. Okay, Natasha, same to you. How old is too old to be president? So I... Like what Allison said, I think it really depends. There's a lot of individual variability. And I also think the person's disposition and their ability to rely on others and take in information from others um, and manage their emotions and behave not uh, impulsively, those are factors that are just as important as how quickly you are to react to things and things like, right, things that we were talking about earlier about speed and intelligence. I think it really is about can you consider others' opinions and take that into account and build off of your own richness of experience to make decisions that are sound and considerate. Does it seem to you that either one of these candidates can do that? No, no, never mind. That's a political science question. <laughs> no, that's not a clinical question. Okay. Daniel, I should give you the last word on this. Uh, I, I I don't want to assume that you're going to make it unanimous, but I got a feeling you are. I'd rather make it anonymous than unanimous. <laughs> uh, I. I believe that science, Steve, I believe that science exists as a public trust and it should be apolitical. Science just is. It should be for everyone, for people of all political beliefs. So I don't really like the question, but uh, how old is too old? But I would say that um, I think many, I'm a dual citizen also, many of us in the United States would like to see younger candidates. The system is sort of rigged towards incumbents. It's hard to get started when you're younger. It's hard to raise funds. And so we're stuck with what we have. Uh, and I think the advantage of younger candidates is that they uh, are they tend to look forward with a longer event horizon. They, they tend to have uh, more, I would say, uh, tend to have more creative ideas in general. Uh, but I think another important factor in, in this particular election is ask yourself not who the commander in chief is going to be and only that question, but what kind of team are they going to assemble? If they can assemble a team, a cabinet, 
and other advisors who are um, intelligent and compassionate and can solve problems and move the country in the direction you want it to move, that's the person to vote for because we exist in a system where it's not an autocrat, it's it's a team. Well, one of the more amusing Best things- team builder. Right. One of the more amusing things about this race is that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is considered the youth candidate and he's 70. So I don't know, maybe Allison's right. We got to reevaluate everything here. Uh, Daniel Levitin, Natasha Raja, Allison Sekuler, it's really good of all three of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thank you. And as we say in Cook County, Chicago, to two of you anyway, vote early, vote often. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Growing old, so the joke goes, may not be great, but it's better than the alternative. And it turns out, how we view it isn't just a neutral thing. It can actually result in differing health outcomes. Alison Chastine is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, and she joins us now to explain. Nice to have you in that chair. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about benevolent ageism, which doesn't sound like two words that ought to go together. So that what does it mean? It doesn't sound like it should be that bad, does it? Yeah. But actually, that's part of the tricky aspect of it. Um, when we think about different kinds of prejudices, we often think about them being expressed in a hostile manner. But in the case of benevolent prejudices, and in this case, benevolent ageism, what it means is that it's a prejudice expressed with like warm and caring, seemingly caring overtones. But it's at the same time implying that the person it's directed at um, doesn't have competence or is incapable of doing something. Give me an example of how we might see it. So we might see it, for example, um, say you go to um, Best Buy to purchase some computer equipment with your grandparent. Mm -hmm. And the person from Best Buy either doesn't even talk to the grandparent, who is the actual customer, mm -hmm. and directs all, all the attention to the younger you know, granddaughter or grandson. But even if they do talk to the uh, grandparent, for example, they might use sort of um, ter terms like deer or honey and talk to them and like, oh, well, you don't need to worry about those specifics or specs about the product. Because the you assumption know? is they're an idiot and the, yeah. the kid only yeah, knows what's going exactly. on. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Now, what actual physical harmful health effects can result from that kind of benevolent ageism? Well, it can lead um, an older person or even a younger person, if you're the um, target of a benevolent form of prejudice, it can lead them feeling a bit undermined and feeling like other people don't think that they're up to the task at hand. So it can kind of um, chip away at their sense of uh, self-esteem and self-efficacy and feelings of confidence that they can undertake a task. And can it affect your actual physical health? Yeah, so um, the research on ageism in general has shown that it can have some pretty um, negative effects on older people in a number of different ways, um, physical, cognitive, and emotional, which we can talk about the different forms if you Sure, want. well, because I presume it chips away at your confidence and makes you think less of yourself, and that's never a good thing. Right, so um, if you're um, really starting to think about sort of uh, these negative age stereotypes of, oh, maybe I, you know, this is true, I can't do these things anymore, maybe I am aging in a negative way, that might lead you to, as an older person, to start thinking about, well, I guess I shouldn't try, you know, to take on, you know, some sort of weight training or resistance training or try this form of exercise, which we know there's so many health benefits to engaging in those kinds of physical exercise and health behaviors to improving aging in later life. So it can kind of undermine um, people's willingness to try new things, for example, and take on challenges if they're sort of getting these messages that they're, they're incompetent or incapable of taking those on. So if an older person believes the negative stereotypes that perhaps this benevolent ageism reflects, can it have an impact on the satisfaction with which they enjoy life? Sounds to me like you're saying it can. Absolutely. Um, the World Health Organization did a, a, a big report a, a few years ago on ageism, and they looked at studies from around the world. And uh, they found that uh, across you know, 45 different countries and over 400 studies that there's a lot of negative impacts of ageism along these different um, 
ways we talked about. But one of the things that they looked at was, for example, quality of life assessments among older people, and they found that um, to the extent that older people were sort of buying into those negative aging stereotypes, the more they did so, then the lower their quality of life um, they were mm. reporting to experience. So um, it definitely seems to have some sort of association with how people experience aging. Do we accept the fact that that probably in the main, the people who are doing it don't mean to be ageist. They actually Yeah, that's the tricky part about benevolent ageism. Again, going back to that warm overtone, it can be something that uh, people enact and trying to assist an older person, for example. The problem lies in the assumption that an older person needs the assistance in the first place. Um, and I'm not saying you can't offer help to an older person. Uh, you certainly can, can offer that. But if they say, no, thank you, I can manage, or I'm, I'm fine, then I think we should allow older people to take on those challenges and, you know, and see what they can do if they feel they can take those on. So it's when we are really kind of forcing that unwanted help on older people that that can send a negative message to can them. I get, you know, something just popped into my head, and I got to get your advice on this. I was on the subway one day. <laughs> Um, I was on the subway one day, and a probably 20-year-old woman saw me standing and offered me her seat. And two things popped through my head. Number one, I thought, oh my gosh, am I actually at that stage of life now where people <laughs> look at me and think, you need some help, you better sit down. And the second thing was, I wanted to tear a strip off her and say, hey, what do you think's going on here? Now, how should... I just said, no, thank you, but what should I have done? Well, that's, that's a, a great question, and the subway example comes up a lot because we actually see on the subway images of you should give up your seat for in, you know, icons of different people, like a pregnant person, or and one of them is a, a depiction of an older person, usually with a cane, it's the most common depiction. Um, so there is this message that you should give up your seat to someone who uh, seems older. Um, I, again, I would go back to, you can offer that seat to the older person, um, and if they refuse it and don't want it, then you know, you've know you offered the seat, and mm -hmm. that's, that's enough. Let's finish up on this, and I'm gonna throw some numbers at you here. In Japan, life expectancy in the year 2020 was about 85, pretty good. In Canada, it was about 82, almost as good. In Japan, apparently, they revere their elderly, so much so they have a public holiday called Respect for the Aged Day. Can we make the connection between life expectancy and how the elderly are viewed in respective countries? Well, again, going back to that study by the WHO, uh, one of the things they found in terms of physical health outcomes was that ageism is negatively associated with longevity. That is, uh, people live, uh, don't live as long in places where they feel like they're experiencing a lot of ageism. Um, so to that end, in any country that, um, where you might see reduced ageism, perhaps then you would see you know, greater longevity. Um, getting back to uh, the question of perhaps cultural differences, uh, the evidence is pretty mixed at this point. Some evidence has suggested that uh, older adults who live in Eastern countries or cultures um, experience a bit less ageism than older adults who live in more Western cultures or countries, but um, other studies have found the opposite, and some have found no differences at all. Huh. And I think it's getting a little tougher to tell the difference given the global nature of, for example, Western culture and being spread around the world through, you know, over time through the internet and media and things. So we've seen greater exposures to Eastern and Western cultures on both sides over time. So it, it's getting harder, I think, in some ways to isolate those effects. Bottom line, let's get rid of ageism, even the benevolent kind. If we can, that'd be great. Amen. Okay. That's Alison Chastine, Professor of Psychology, University of Toronto. Thanks for coming in at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. With 17 albums and three Juno Awards to his name, singer-songwriter Ron Sexsmith is a critical part of the Canadian songbook. He also just turned 60 and celebrated this milestone with a retrospective performance at Toronto's iconic Massey Hall. His latest record is called The Vivian Line, and Ron Sexsmith joins us here in our studio. I'm going to start by saying it's great to have you back here, Mr. Yeah. Sexsmith. Yeah. You won't remember this, but you were here probably 25 years ago to do a show we used to do here called Studio Two. Now, yeah. don't tell me you remember that because it's too long ago. You know, I have vague memories of it. I do. 
And and because uh, I remember we did a book thing a while back, mm -hmm. um, for yes. Dundurn or whatever that was. Yes. And, and I remember thinking, oh, I, and I knew that, I mean, I've been watching on TV for so long, but I thought, I think I've done, there was a, sh a show that I, I was a part of. And, but you know, you do so many, I mean, I did so many morning shows. I, I, when was that, was that a morning show? Or was no, that no, it aired in the evenings. Right. And, and you, I remember the, the uh, producer of the segment said yeah. to me, we got to get this guy now, because he's going to get big <laughs> and we'll never be able to get him again. Boy, was he wrong, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no, did, did, au uh, contraire. Do you remember what song I played? Uh, I do not. Okay. I do not. I wonder if there's any footage of that. I would love to see that. You know, there is. And here's the problem, because I, when I knew you were coming in, I said, we got to try and get the footage of this. Yes. But it was so long ago it's on one inch videotape right it's not digital Whoa. and we don't have any machines in this building that'll play one inch videotape anymore right <laughs> so that's the problem that's why we probably won't see a clip from it here wow and also i, I would uh, you know the ravages of time i would be like oh my god i was a baby then or <laughs> the ravages have been pretty kind to you you still got a bit of a baby face you well know. i have a face anyway you know <laughs> i mean the thing is i i, I notice uh, i've just noticed especially since the pandemic like you know uh I'm getting a little losing it on top and all these sort of humbling things that happen, you know, as you move, go, go forward in life. And I'm trying to be okay with it because I see people sometimes that they're just very comfortable in their own skin and I've never, never been totally comfortable. <laughs> Darling, be happy with it. Thank Those you. Those of us in our 60s need to be just grateful that we're still upright. I, yeah, amen, amen. <laughs> I am really trying to be okay with it. But you know, I, li I have this job and you have this job too, but like I had to walk, walk, you know, you have to walk out on stage and you feel like you let people down, you know, if you, if you don't look uh, a certain way. I, I think that's why so many performers will get, go under the knife and do all these things. And I, I will never do that. But right. I, I just, I, I know that people aren't coming to see me expecting me to look the way I did, you know, in the 90s yeah. or, or expect not that I look good then but are expecting me to look like you know Brad Pitt or something but it still it goes it plays tricks with your head sometimes like you know you you pass a mirror and you know a store window and like oh my god what you know you're thinking you're looking good and then something shoots you down <laughs> all the time I'm pretty sure they're coming to hear your music as yes. opposed to make sure that you look like Clark Gable or George Clooney and, and I know and that's it yeah. and that's true and I gotta I have to you know, I used to even write notes and put them on, on the ground by my mic stand saying, you know, like, open your eyes, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, 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 you know, you've got this or all this kind of stuff. Good, um, Little good. motivational <laughs> notes, yeah. <laughs> Can you, uh, let's, let's go back. I, I really want to, you're from St. Catharines, Ontario. Yes. I'm from Hamilton, not too, too far, far away. Rival towns, kind of. Mm. <laughs> not too much, because no. there's not much of a rivalry when one city's so much better than the other. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> Did you come from a musical family? Uh, I'm going to say no. Um, you know, but we did come from, I did come from a family where my mom let me play the records in the house. Hmm. My dad left when I was very young, but he left his records. So when I was old enough to uh, put them on the, on the turntable, you know, my 45s and things, mm -hmm. they were, you know, a box that... My dad had left, you know, some of them had his name written on them or my mom, a lot of it doo-wop and country music. And, and I was just, uh, just fascinated by these records, you know? I wanted to know what the A side was or the B side was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was amazing how everyone had their own voice, such unique voice. I find a lot with today, um, you know, there's a lot of affectation and sometimes you can't tell one mm -hmm. singer from the next. But back then you couldn't mistake you know, like Buddy Holly from Johnny Cash or Dusty Springfield from Karen Carpenter. I mean, they just, they just had these very unique things. So I just became obsessed with and also all the music on the radio. I just, so you think that planted a seed with you? It really did. And nothing else connected with me, you know? I mean, I liked soccer, I guess, but, but music, like my brothers were always outside running around and I was always like sitting by the, the stereo or by the, or even if you played road hockey or something, there'd be a transistor radio right on the curb, you know, playing the hits of the day. So mm -hmm. it really did, you felt like, you know, it was a bit of a soundtrack, you know, mm -hmm. some movie you were in. How old were you when you picked up the guitar for the first time? Um, I was about 14 and I got forced into it. I had started a band with some friends just because it seemed cool. Not because we were, we had any talent, but, and I just wanted to be the singer, you know? I wanted to be like Roger Daltrey with the mic. And uh, nobody wanted to play guitar. And I got sort of shamed into getting a, a this electric, it was like a silver tone guitar from Sears. Mm. And um, 
but Four, it, 14 is kind of late, isn't it, to pick it, up the guitar? I know, and and, uh, and the thing is, my first love uh, was always piano, but, hmm. you know, I play piano now, like, badly, but I can write on it. But, you know, it was sort of the bane of my existence was um, my mom played piano when she was a kid, and the the piano that was at my grandfather's, my grandparents' house was, was supposed to come to her, hmm. and it ended up going to her sister, and they used it to put plates on, you know, like do it had a doily hanging on it. Yes. And I, if that piano came to us, I would be just like Liberace by now, you know. Um, so I didn't start playing until I was like in the late 30s or 40 or something. Huh. So um, you didn't come up with conservatory and all that business. No, and I had I was self-taught, and um, and you know now I'm at a point where I can play and not look at my hands, and I but uh, I didn't learn the right way. So but I um, but the guitar was kind of like second prize for me, but I did get into it, mm. and so I would say by the time I was around 17, you know I was really into the Who and and all that, and that's the kind of I wanted to be like like Townsend and. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I did, I do love the guitar, but initially I was kind of like, oh, why do I have to do this, you mm. know? So. We should say, you live in Stratford, Ontario today. Yes. You have not done what so many others do in this country, which is try to find fame and fortune south of the border. You stayed here. Yeah. How come? Well, there was a lot of pressure, uh, you know, to move to L.A. initially, because I was mm -hmm. signed there. And um, at one point I even had an apartment there. Um, that the label paid for back when labels had money, you know, they, it's mm -hmm. insane. Um, and also there was pressure at one point to move to England because the UK has always been my biggest uh, market. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, I don't know, I've, it always meant a lot to me that Gordon Lightfoot didn't do that. I've, you know, I mean, not that I have any problem with Joni or Neil going down to LA or mm -hmm. Leonard. I get why they went, you know, to because that's where it was happening at the time, and also that's where the nice weather was. And, and lots you know, of money. Lots of money to be made, yeah. And I, and I, I guess I'm uh, also, because I had kids, I had small kids, and I, I couldn't uh, just sort of, you know, what's the word? I didn't want any upheaval, mm. and they were going to school. and, and So there was a, a pressure from different sources, say, you know, telling me, yeah, yeah I'd probably have a better shot at you know, making it, you know, in, in another place. You know, Eugene Levy made the same decision you did. He stayed. He stayed. He's lived in downtown Toronto his whole time. Even when he was making, making all movies, movies out there, he always stayed here. Yeah. Yeah. I ran Wanted in. his kids to be educated here, wanted them to grow up knowing what it means to be Canadian. And does Dan, Dan live here? Or does he even... That I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are incredible, you know. But you, uh, uh, how do I put this? There's lots of sort of very famous musicians mm. who have both uh, recorded your stuff and admired your stuff. I'll name some of them here. Rod Stewart, Coldplay, Emmylou Harris, Katie Lang, Michael Buble, mm -hmm. Leslie Feist. Is she still, is she just Feist or is she Leslie Feist? I call her Leslie, but, but I think, yeah. Because she sometimes just goes by one name, right? I think she's known as Feist. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you've got this weird thing where you're in some ways, well, you just referenced it. You're sort of more popular in other countries than you are here in Canada. Mm. Do you have a theory about why that is? Um... I think initially, if you look back on the 90s and what was happening musically, it wasn't what I was doing, you know, I mean, uh, you, you could, you know, Pearl Jam, and it was a, almost, a, it was a lot of, the music had a lot of kind of, like, anger. It was I don't harder. Know, yeah, yeah, I don't know why, there seemed to be a lot of, ah, you know, like mm -hmm. this, and I didn't do that. So I would travel around, in the, especially in America, I toured so much in the 90s down there, listening to the radio, and I didn't hear anything that sounded like what I was doing. They could not get me on the radio. And not, mm. you know, I mean, up, up here even, I didn't get a whole lot of radio. And I just think because I was a bit older, I didn't get signed until I was 30, 30 or 31. Mm. And, my, and all my initial influences were British Invasion, you know, the Kinks and the, uh, all, you know, the Beatles, obviously. And it was, so my sound was like the f sort of folky stuff from the Canadian folk stuff and the British Invasion. And so when I finally, uh, you know, when my album was finally released in, over there in 96, because they were about to, the label was about to drop me in 95 because my record did not perform. They didn't like me. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it wasn't until Elvis Costello held my album up. Um, it was December of 95 on a magazine, and that was really the shot heard around the world because then that's when I found my audience. And I remember going to England the first time, and I got this hero's welcome 
the band Squeeze opened up for me. And it was a band that I was a huge fan of. Mm. I met Paul McCartney the first week I was there, second week I had breakfast with. I mean, it was insane after a year of touring, opening for everybody and nobody really caring. Um, it felt kind of, you know, I felt vindicated. You and know. yet, mm. you celebrated your 60th birthday not too long ago with a sold out show at Massey Hall. That's kind of yeah. cool, I would think. I'm still kind of reeling from that, you know, because- And they sang happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was powerful. I, and it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even my birthday on, the, on that evening, but right. um, I mean, Massey Hall, you know, I mean, that was like the fifth time I've played there and, mm. but, and I've always got a good crowd, but, but I've never like sold it out until, you know, this, this show and, um, yeah, you know, but my, my mind is still back there and I'm thinking about all the things that I, I thought went well and things that maybe could have done better, you know. I'm going to read a quote here okay. from the Globe and Mail that is very honest. Okay. And I want to ask you a question that emerges from it. Here we go. Sheldon, put this up and I'll read along. I don't know that I've been the greatest dad or the greatest husband or anything but I don't think that's what I'm here to do. I did my best, but songwriting is what I'm supposed to be doing. It's easier for me to almost be a better human being in a song than in real life. Yeah. That's quite an acknowledgement, and I, I wonder why you feel that way. Well, I think that was from uh, this documentary that they did called Love Shines, and I can't remember what the, the original question was, you know, when they, um, but I think I was beating myself up a bit at the time, you know, because I do have a lot of regret. I mean, I, uh, when, I when I found that I was going to be a father at, a, I think it was like 21. Hmm. Um, well, I found out when I was 20. In some ways, I, I wasn't, you know, not ready for that. And I felt, I had all these dreams, you know, of making hmm. it in music. And, and I felt when, that, oh, and all these, it's all gone out the window now. But it, 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 in, act, in actuality, it was the opposite because I didn't really become a songwriter till my son was born. <laughs> and I felt like for sticking around um, and doing you know, the right thing that I was almost, I don't know, this will sound crazy, but I always felt I was like, I put, I was a gift, you know, like for doing the right thing, I'm gonna give you this gift of song. Cause I never wrote a songs before, you know. <laughs> And 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 I know that just sounds nuts, but that's what, but I, I you know, but I all of a sudden I, it gave me a sense of purpose. But you know, and for a long time I was dad. I was reading the bedtime stories, going to the park, mm. and 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 then I was gone all the time, and I had so much regret about that. I think I was a good dad, and um, you know, but then it, it came a point where. You know, I was away all the time, and I was off, almost felt like I was leading a double life because I was having so much fun on the road and all the stupid things musicians get up to. Mm. And I had so much guilt, and then I'd come home, and then I was, I was dad again. And there's all this re readjustment. Every time you, you come back, it, not just for you, but for them, to all of a sudden there's a guy in the house again, and, you know, and it sort of disrupts the rhythm of, of what, they're, what they're doing. Well, the, 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 yeah. that first kid is an adult now. Yeah, the, uh, first kid is what? Thirty-four? Uh, no, uh, actually, thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. And my, okay. da my da uh, a daughter is going to be thirty-four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had a conversation with those kids, which went something like, "Do you think my lengthy absences when you were growing up has dam, you know, damaged you?" Um. You know, I, I don't know. If we've, we've definitely with my daughter, you know. We've we've talked because it's hard to even broach these subjects. My my wife, my current wife, Colleen, is very she gets in there. She likes to you know I'm more of one of these guys like I just want everyone to be happy and I don't want to you know. But you have these moments sometimes, and I I know that it's it's hurt them, you know not especially my daughter because she was younger when I started traveling. My son was ten when I when all of a sudden you know and then of course that family unit fell apart and I've and that was and and. Again, even at that time, I, I was just trying to keep everyone, make everyone feel happy, mm. and 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 I've never been very good at. Uh, I don't come from that family that, you know, talks. I wouldn't have any really experience doing that. I feel, I do regret that. I think, but I, my relationship with my kids now, I think, is is in some ways better than it has has been. And I mean, not that it was ever bad. Like we never. Mm. I wasn't like. The, you know, dad yelled or, you know, you know, anything like this.
but I do, I do have a lot of regret for being away so much and, I, and for the fact that we couldn't keep it together. Hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, I never would have met Colleen and, and that's been, and you know, I, I feel that, yeah, and getting back to the quote, I just always felt the reason um, when I became a songwriter, I, uh, I mean, I, I wanted a career before in music before I started writing songs, you know, I, and, but I, I do feel that, um, you know, having this experience, it gave me, it, it, I had to grow up in a hurry and it gave me these things to write about. Before I had my kids, I don't know what I was writing about, just probably frivolous stuff, you know. Well, Amy Skye talked about that when she was here once. She yeah. said after she became a mother, it, it so profoundly changed what she felt and what she wanted to write about yeah. that it was beautiful. Yeah, and and in the last, you know, uh, um, when I played my show, uh, you know, both my kids were there, and I sent out a couple songs. And I mean, you know, it's. I think it, I, I, I maybe I'll never know how how hard it was for them because they don't talk about it either. Mm -hmm. Like not having like one, you know, their dad's there and all of a sudden he isn't there. Um, and probably at some point we'll have to sit down and have that talk. And um, but I think. Uh, I think they understand, they get it that I have this, I do have, I have uh, this purpose, I think, you know? And I don't know that that's more important, but I, it's also how I made a living, you know? And they understand they that understand you, that. you yeah. talk through your music. Yeah. That's, that's one I, way I put you- put all my emotions into my music. Yeah. I'm not good at confrontation, I'm not good with, hmm. uh, you know? So I think they get it, I think they, they get me and, 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 yeah, and I, I, I'd like to think so anyway. Yeah. Can we talk about how you how you talk through your music, how you do what you do? What comes first with you, lyrics yeah. or music? Well, you know, um, it's a bit of both. And kind of getting back to the quote, the thing about being a better person in, in a song, I think what I meant by that is I think your best aspects, you know, when you have time to actually think about it and put it down in paper, you you know, the, the way you, you really feel or the way you see things or, or, or the person you would like to be, you, you can, um, you put your best, you know, face in, in the song. Mm -hmm. And you can't always live up to it in real life because as much as you try, you know, because things happen and I get stressed out by, by life and I'm not good with change at all, <laughs> you know, but, but songwriting has given me an outlet to pour all, all whatever confusion I'm wrestling with or, um, I chuckled there for a second because you, yeah. you, you're a very gifted, talented person at what you do, and yet you are conveying an image of somebody who's yeah. like barely keeping it together. Oh, no. And it, yeah. it just doesn't feel that way from the outside. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I have a lot of, I mean, my wife Colleen is a kind of a miracle in a way. She's so capable and uh, like I don't, I don't know, I don't drive, you know, I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> I, I really, I, it's kind of like my one, if I have a, a superpower, it's this, I'm laser focused on this one thing mm. that I, I found that, oh, you know, that I could do this, you know, like when I started writing songs in Quebec when my son was a few weeks old, before that, I knew I wanted to play music, but I didn't really have any evidence to, you know, back it up. And so songwriting's just given me this thing that, you know, because you want to contribute to the world somehow, you know, and people do important things. I don't, not that my songwriting is that important, but I just feel, well, that's what I can do. That's my, you know, gift <laughs> to the to the world, or that's my body of work. Mm -hmm. And the, and um, yeah, so uh, I I really I really uh, I'm kind of useless in most areas of life. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not handy, I'm not, so I just, well, I try to be helpful though. I'm just, uh, you know, and my, and my wife understands that and, uh, and I, I like to think I help her with things too. I bet you're capable of giving advice. So why don't we finish up on that? Because okay. your, your first big album didn't happen until you were in your 30s, yeah, and, which is unusual, you know, for many recording artists. Uh, these their, days especially. Yeah, it's yeah. in their 20s, exactly. Sometimes in their teens. Yeah. And you've done 17 albums since, so obviously you've kind of figured some stuff out. If if somebody is an aspiring musician mm. watching us now, based on your experiences, what advice would you give them? Well, I think uh, I hanging in there. You know, for me, I 
I worked for a courier as a courier for a number of years, and many people were telling me to pack it in. I mean, people close to me, you know, because but it never would have happened, you know, if I listened to them. Hmm. And I, I just had this. I was stubborn about it, you know. And I think so. Perseverance is very important. I mean, the, the the whole landscape has changed. I wouldn't even know how to begin now. You know, before it was you try to get labels to come see you play or you send demos out. I don't I don't really know how they do it now. But I, I think so. The only advice I would have is is about the music. Like, I mean, obviously I write a certain kind of song. It's not the kind of song that Bieber does or whatever. Mm. But I'm sure there's the same amount of dedication to what they're doing. You know, I, I, I do the work, and and I just think if you're going to be a songwriter, have a point of view. You know, have a have a like your own thing. Have something that they can't get anywhere else. You know, whether it's your own melody, whether you know. And I, and I, I mean, every song has its own melody. But I mean, most songwriters, if you look at their body of work, there's something recognizable. There's a thread that run, like Van Morrison. There's a melody he does. You could trace on all his records, and and and. Or Randy Newman, you know, or Warren Zevon, mm -hmm. they have this point of view that, and it's not for everybody, but if you connect with it, it's like, you know, where have you been all my life, you know? <laughs> and I think if you're going to be a songwriter, you know, have something to say, you know? Um, don't just sing about, you know, oh, she looks fine or whatever it is, or, you know, <laughs> I don't know what they're singing about. <laughs> but, you know, have something to say because obviously the world, I mean, she, I mean, I get it, music can be escapism and the, the world's very scary now. And I and and I like to try to like for me I like to write songs that are comforting, even for my own head, because hmm. I figure if it makes me feel better that someone else is going to, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna resonate and maybe make them feel better. So I, so that would be my advice. Just you know have something have something to say. You know. Well, my suggestion is we not wait another 25 years before doing this again. I oh. Yeah, I, I'm really happy to be here. I've been, we watch you all the time. I'm like, when are they going to ask me? So. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. Thank you. Ron, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, Steve. Tomorrow on the agenda. We don't want to talk about approvals. We want to talk about building starts, and that's what we're going to be judging cities on. That's the most important metric. And now he seems to be granting a little bit more slack. That's tomorrow on the agenda.